ready. Go. Uh, hi, my name's John Williams and I race human powered vehicles, aka Bellomobiles. Bellomobiles are the missing evolutionary link between a bicycle and a car. So you have the benefits of weather protection as you do in a car, and then the green and health credentials of a bicycle. I used to ride uprights, you know. I had an Italian Lambretta scooter, motorbike type thing. I had an accident with that, fractured my L5 vertebrae. And then whenever I tried to ride my road bike, I'd have a severe backache for a few days afterwards. And then one day I was walking past a bicycle shop on Essex Road in London and something bright yellow and low caught my eye. So I went over and had a look through the window and it was a low racer recumbent, super low, beautiful curves, bright yellow and it was called a Challenge Jester. I'll never forget it. For about two weeks I used to go up to walk up there, have a look, look in the window and just gaze at this machine. And so I went to see them, tried one, couldn't ride it, fell off and bought one. Then I found out about Velomobiles and I thought, oh God, even faster than a recumbent, how can this be? And there's weather protection. And then that was it. Quite a few bystanders say to me, aren't you worried that you're not going to be seen? Well, I mean, the thing is 2.8 meters long. Uh, it's pretty much the size of a fridge. So um, if you saw a fridge lying in the road and you were driving your car, you definitely wouldn't plow into it. I've had one accident with a car in 15 years. And that was, I think I was riding at about 25 miles an hour in Lewisham. And I think I sprained an ankle. If, if I was on, say, my Brompton at the time, I would have had, I think, severe injuries. So if I was on the Brompton, I would have flown over the handlebars, landed on my head somewhere else. Uh, it could have been a lot worse. The Velomobile or Velo car, in a recognizable form, was first produced by a French designer called Charles Moshe in the 1920s. While the car was still expensive to purchase, he wanted to offer something easier for the average person. He had discovered that it was more efficient to cycle in a sitting down position, and if you gave that bike an aerodynamic shell, it would be even faster still. There was a French amateur cyclist who used to race recumbent bicycles, basically lying down, two-wheeler, and he was beating all comers. So the bicycle industry decided that this is not good for business, this guy on this weird contraption beating uh, the best road cyclists of the day so they pressured the UCI of the day to ban recumbents and that put back the development production of recumbent bicycles uh, for quite a few years. Although Moshe died not long after this that wasn't the complete death of this company thankfully. During World War II there was a fuel crisis especially in France people took to his velo cars the best way to get around. When the war ended, people got back into their cars and forgot about Charles Moshe's uh, velo car. And then in the 70s, 80s, recumbent bicycles started to have a bit of a renaissance again. And uh, racing was taken off in Europe, America, big star, there were a few pioneers, Mike Burrows. Then people decided that, you know, recumbents are nice and comfortable and they're fast. But it would be really nice if uh, there was a bit of weather protection as well. Companies such as Aleveda from Velomobile World have since then slowly refined Velomobiles for speed and efficiency. The truth is, it's only now, as we are in another petrol crisis that can last decades, that people are really looking at Velomobiles again seriously. And now, it's a whole new realm. Velomobiles, because they're made in such small numbers and made from exotic materials such as carbon fiber etc the prices are quite high uh, so when I started and bought my first Velomobile I, I think I saved up 3,500 pounds and I bought a second-hand Velomobile which was like 
a dream to me. So a lot of people go the second hand route, but you know, there aren't that many. Without innovation, Velomobiles are at risk of remaining something of a gentlemanly pursuit. I think to get people into Velomobiles in the lower range, I think if you could get yourself a city commuting Velomobile for say 3,000, that would be a winner. But at the moment, I mean, this something like this, you're looking at starting price of 10,000 euros. I know a lot of people, as soon as you tell them the price of a Velomo, they're like, I could buy a car for that, you know, a Lada Neva Jeep or something. And I'm like, well, yeah, you could, but then you've got to factor in the running costs over three years compared to a car. But now the Cycle to Work scheme have increased the amount that you can apply for because a lot of the guys who work in offices and stuff have high-end road bikes which cost upwards from eight to fifteen thousand pounds. There are more and more people cycling every day and a lot of people tell me that they're, they're not they would love to cycle but they just don't want to be turning up to work so true. And you know as I'm out and about in town especially this year I'm seeing pedal vans everywhere so I'm hoping it's only a matter of time before vehicles come out that convinces the general public to seriously consider them as an alternative means of transportation. Hi, I'm Tamara Ivankova. I'm the founder of Amara Automotive and we're creating a vehicle that makes cycling attractive to the masses. So it's a four-wheel e-bike that has the comforts of a car but the lower running costs and emissions of a bike. And our Velomobiles needs only about 3% of the equivalent energy compared to battery electric cars to go the same distance. So my background is in motorsport. I started working in Formula One when I was 15. I got introduced to Velomobiles through my work with the Human Powered Aircraft Club at Southampton University. I was part of a team that built two successful aeroplanes and competed in the British Human Powered Aircraft competitions. That coincided with the British Human Powered Club where they race Velomobiles, so I got introduced to it that way. In terms of human powered aeroplanes, the greatest thing about them is the engineering challenge. You need to build extremely lightweight structures. They have the wingspan of private jets but weigh 40 kilos. The thing about human powered aeroplanes, when you see them fly, you just think they shouldn't be able to. Seeing them get up in the air and suddenly they become quiet, you get a really surreal feeling and yeah, it's a bit addicting. One of the biggest issues in the way that cars, vehicles that transport people are designed at the moment is that they're designed to carry loads that they don't usually carry. Over 71% of all car journeys are under 5 miles and over 62 have only one occupant, but the average car mass is over 2 tonnes um, and most of the time you're carrying that empty weight. The other aspect that's very important when considering the issues that current vehicles face is the lack of design for efficiency. They're not designed to be aerodynamic, they're not designed to be low drag. With the market shifting to mass adoption of SUVs, it directly goes against that. The LSC Avelomobile is the same height as existing sports cars on the road, so as an Audi R8 at 1.32 meters. It's the same width as current bicycle trailers designed to fit in any cycle lane and with the projected weight of 45 kilos. We want a vehicle that is more efficient than regular bikes and the most efficient sort of practical Velomobile on the market. I have always wanted to do something worthwhile and build vehicles that could really have a positive impact on the environment. So taking those two aspects is what really like inspired me. So the Velomobiles that are on the market at the moment haven't been adopted en masse because they're designed to be machines for leisure. So they have a massive focus on performance. They're really low vehicles. They're very awkward to get in and out of. You have a very small opening that you have to kind of shimmy out of. The design philosophy that they use, so 
a lot of them look quite quirky and it's almost like an odd thing to be seen in and our focus is really on creating something that is quite normal to look at. Velomobiles, in terms of the structure that you have around you, you have a full body which protects you from surface impacts, but they are viewed as unsafe by most because of how low they are to the ground. We're building a vehicle to give them that sense of comfort, but with the significantly lower costs and emissions of bikes. Our four-wheel e-bike, the Elysee, sits one adult and a child or 300 litres of storage. Again, mimicking the use of a car so that when you do make the change to it, it's as close to the comforts that you're used to. One thing that a lot of people don't know is that Velomobiles don't actually need a licence. Um, they're bound by the exact same regulations as regular bikes if they have an e-motor like ours then e-bike regulations so you don't need a driving license you at the moment don't need to pay road tax under the same regulations the e-bikes are limited to a maximum speed of 25 kilometers an hour however that's only on electric power alone so actually if you have a vehicle that's efficient enough to be ridden on human power alone then you can go far beyond that speed with our vehicle, certainly it has a direct drive system for human power so that you actually don't need to have a battery present at all to be able to ride it. So even if you do run out of power, you can very easily get to your destination. The batteries typically used in e-bikes like ours can be charged on mains power alone. So that's a massive positive. To have a city where velomobiles are adopted en masse, I think a key problem to solve is the storage aspect of them and to turn car parking spaces into protected velomobile spaces where you can lock your velomobile safely because you can fit up to five, six of them in one parking spot. You can't just rely on mass adoption of battery electric vehicles. What you need is different solutions working together to implement a sustainable travel network. I'm Clemmy, I am the Rider Operations Manager at Ride and I oversee the management of our electric cargo bike fleet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Val, uh, I've been a courier for about three years now and I've been working with Ride for a year and a half. So throughout this time I've, I've worked in vans and mopeds and also in the e-bikes. So there are some stats that say that other cities' carbon emission last mile contributes to around 30% of it and I think it's probably pretty key for the last mile to clean up. One of the major issues facing last mile delivery at the moment is rising costs like with every industry. I think in comparison to other segments of the delivery journey, the last mile is comparatively quite expensive, primarily because there is a big labour cost that's involved and I think one of the ways that EVEs or cargo bikes in general can help with that is uh, facilitating a multi-drop model, so picking up multiple parcels from one hub and delivering to many different addresses in comparison to maybe a cyclist who can take only one or two, um, a cargo bike can take between 10 and 25 depending on the size of the parcel. In comparison with a van, I think the costs associated with running a fleet of vans are much higher than a fleet of cargo bikes because you're talking insurance, you're talking fuel, you're talking um, the actual cost of the van, the um, supply timelines that it takes to grow a fleet of vans. Cargo bike, you're not considering any of those. Lightness is important with your vehicle type because you want all of the energy to be going towards moving the parcels, not the actual vehicle. The gains there, we can feed back into the rider's pay. So compared to the vans or a moped, uh, working with the ease, I feel uh, obviously it's a bit more of a workout, so I feel a bit healthier and also uh, a little bit safer on the roads than on the mopeds. 
because we have the protection from, from the rain, obviously. They handle pretty well, and they feel pretty safe. I don't, I don't feel like I'm at risk, like compared to Ur Urban Arrow, for example, which is only a two-wheeler. I feel like I can get hit any time, and uh, with the ease, I feel pretty safe. It's incredibly beneficial um, for our unit economics that you uh, do not require a license or a CBT to handle a cargo bike. One, the onboarding tools are a lot less expensive because there's a lot less that we need to check. Um, and your training time um, to becoming a fully vetted cargo bike rider is a lot shorter. So those cost savings, again, we can pour back into the rider's pay. An issue that is lingering and yet to be solved with cargo bikes is the infrastructure, specifically in London, is not set up yet to facilitate them on routes. I think the current width of most cycle lanes, especially in central London, will just about fit an EVE, which is inconvenient for other riders. They're pretty roomy, so they, they, they fit quite a lot of stuff. But compared to a, to a smaller bike, I, I do get stuck sometimes, but compared to maybe a van, I can get out of the traffic a little bit easier because I can also use the, uh, the bike lane with these. I think I could definitely see cargo bikes moving into the consumer world. I think there are some obstacles to be overcome before that happens. I think the security of the bikes or the vehicle types that I've seen needs to be improved before they can be parked on the street and left outside your office, for example. But I think European cities seem to be slightly further ahead than London. Adoption is pretty high. I think um, at the moment it feels like demand is outstripping supply for a lot of these cargo bike manufacturers, which I guess is great for the cause and is great for them, but for companies trying to scale their fleet or for individuals who are trying to get hold of a cargo bike, I think it can be a painful process. Yeah, definitely the future, I reckon, of uh, personal transportation. Nothing will get wet inside, so you can carry your laptop, your suit and what have you in the back there, behind the seat. When you get to your office, take everything out, get changed and happy days.